Hey TAs, welcome to the Ecology Lab. Um, we're gonna talk about the terraria, we're gonna talk about all of the stuff that we do in this lab. Please pay careful attention, uh, especially if you've never done this lab before. Make sure you understand all of the parts of it. So we're just gonna go right through the instructor guide and the student guide, um, and then I will have to tape or film later um, the actual terraria, the, the supplies haven't come yet. So I'll send you another video in a little bit. Okay, so in lab today, we are doing ecology. And so they should have done this advanced preparation four weeks ago. They should have their terraria with them. Um, if they didn't fill this out, um, or if they filled it out on a piece of paper, they can go ahead and put it in here. But they were supposed to make some predictions about what might happen and what variables they were testing. Uh, but for the rest of this, we're going, to, we're going to do some exploration first before we even touch the terraria. And so I've got this instructor guide. I'm just gonna go through it with you so you know what you're doing. Um, and so you should start class with a quick discussion. Oops, let me move down to part one. With a quick discussion of what a trophic pyramid is. So you might draw this on the board. They've got it on their, their student guide as well, but draw it on the board and talk about, so troph, that word, it just means energy. And so a trophic pyramid is looking at how energy is flowing through a system and how much energy is at each level. And so you'll want to um, define for them these words that are in bold. So the primary producers, right, these are the plants, these are the, the photosynthetic organisms that are storing energy in these carbon-based molecules that are going to be moving that energy um, up the, the trophic pyramid. And then above that is our primary consumers. These are herbivores. Secondary consumers, you might even have tertiary consumers. Now, we're not going to go up that far in our pyramids, so you can just draw this, but you can point out that those are there. Um, and then we usually draw arrows to indicate the direction of energy flow. So from a plant to a primary consumer. So the arrowhead would be pointing at the primary consumer coming from the primary producer. All right, so once you've introduced that idea, then you're gonna have them explore by asking them to build the food web of the Serengeti. So they've been given these organisms, lion, hyena, wildebeest, buffalo, giraffe, acacia, finger grass, drop seed grass, and red oat grass. Um, and they're supposed to put them onto the pyramid. They can do it on a separate piece of paper, they can do it on their whiteboard, and they're gonna upload that there. So as you're walking around, um, you just might wanna encourage them to first just decide where each organism goes, and then you can decide who's eating who and which direction the energy is going. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me, this is, this is basically the pyramid that I draw, so you'll wanna draw this on the board and help them get to this. Now, I went ahead and drew arrows from every single produ or every single primary producer to every um, herbivore. I have no idea which herbivores eat which ones, uh, and except for the acacia tree. That one is only eaten by giraffes. But if they have arrows pointing to everything, that's totally fine. Um, same thing here where you can see all the primary consumers they are getting energy, or the secondary consumers are getting energy from all the primary consumers, but I don't have an arrow here from buffalo to, hy buffalo to hyena, just because hyenas have a really hard time bringing down such a large animal, uh, but I don't care if they've got that arrow drawn. Um, and so, so the idea is, right, that you've got your primary producers down here, and then you have your primary consumers and your secondary consumers. And what they'll notice is there are less organisms at each level. And so you're gonna have them read their question too, and if we look at what that is, it asks them if the plants make up 100,000 kilograms of the biomass, what would be the biomass at each level above? So have them make a prediction first. Obviously the prediction is that it will be less at each level, but ask them why. Why is it less at each level, right? And so, so generally the rule of thumb is about 10%. So it'd be 10,000 for your primary consumers, 1,000 for your secondary consumers, but that's just an estimate. But the important point is why. So have a discussion and let students reveal to you their ideas about why and using their ideas, you can bring out these, these two main things. So number one, that energy transfer is inefficient. So you lose energy at each exchange and you can just look at us, right? We don't get all the energy out of our food um, that, that's actually there because we spend part of it just heating our bodies and we lose a lot to just heat to the environment. Um, some of it is just indigestible, so we don't get it all. And so all of that is inefficient. You wanna emphasize, or the main idea you wanna emphasize is just that there's not enough food down here to support more organisms at this primary level. And then the organism availability at this primary level is gonna support even less secondary consumers. 
um, just because yet there's just not enough food, right? And so this idea that the level above is regulated by how much is available in the level below, how much food is available in the level below, is called bottom-up regulation, that the things above are being regulated by things coming from below, right? So you want to write that term on the board, bottom-up regulation, the idea that upper levels of the food chain are regulated by how much food is available, available at the level below. All right, so then once you've established this, you're going to have them look at number three. So why don't primary consumers reproduce until their population totally consumes all primary producers? So this is a really good question and one that baffled ecologists for a long time is that if, if everything is regulated by the level below, why doesn't it just grow to the maximum level population size that it totally decimates the level below? Why don't herbivores eat all of the available food sources and just keep reproducing? Right? So have them think about this for a minute. Um, they, they point out, it's really important to point out that, that we don't see this, right? We don't see areas, except for in rare cases, we do see this where, where regulation has gone awry. But in general, you don't see that all of your grass gets consumed or all of the trees in a given environment get consumed, that there's nothing left, right? Um, and so have them think about what might be regulating it. Now, some students might actually suggest predators, and you can say, yay, good job, hold that thought, right? Because that is the idea. But we're going to explore it through reading an article. All right, so then this, you've noticed I have given them 45 minutes for this particular activity um, because it, it, this this article is is complicated and it's not that long but it's a little bit of a difficult read it's old um, and so you want to give them chan a chance to read it so you can see here there's a link right here um, so when they click on this it should take them directly to the library page and they can read this article so give them time to read this article on their own um, and then you can start discussing it so some of the things you want to discuss excuse me, is that pre pre the idea is that predators are regulating the herbivore populations from the top down. That's what this, these authors are suggesting, is, and they call it the green world hypothesis. Why does the world stay green? Because the herbivores are being checked, right? They don't get to grow until they can consume all available food, that they're somehow being regulated, and in this case, they're being regulated by predation. So the, the, pe the, the organisms at the level above them are regulating their numbers. And so that's called top-down regulation. So you want to put that up on the board. Top-down regulation is when predators are regulating the levels below. All right, and there's a particular line in the article that, that this was written in 1960, right? And they say that although rigorous proof that herbivores are generally controlled by predation is lacking, they're thinking that it's the best hypothesis, right? And so the question is, what kind of evidence would be good proof? What are we looking for that, that herbivores really are regulated by predators? And so you want to ask students to come up with ideas. That's this question right here. Ask students to come up with ideas. How would you test the green world hypothesis? So give them a second to talk in their groups, then have them and then have a discussion as a class. The idea being that, you know, we would want to go to an ecosystem and remove the predator or better see an ecosystem where the predator's been removed naturally, um, where we can observe this, right? And, and you might think uh, Yellowstone might pop into your head, right? As a classic example of when a predator has been removed from an ecosystem. Um, so once you've had a discussion about how you might test this, we're actually gonna watch a film where they do test this. Okay, so now you're gonna pull up this film. The link here is in your, dis in your instructor guide. It's called some animals are more equal than others, keystone species and tropic cascades. And it's gonna go through two classic experiments, one in which the scientists removed starfish from tide pools um, and, and watched what happened to the tide pool ecosystem when the, when the main predator, the starfish, was removed. And the other one is, is looking at uh, seagrass and, and or kelp and urchins, sea urchins and, and uh, otters and so what's going on with with these populations um, so you're gonna watch this video it's about 19 minutes okay so once you watch the video you're gonna have a discussion about what you learned so you're gonna watch the two experiments one in which starfish are removed from tide pools and one in which sea otters are removed from the uh, ocean kelp forest <coughs> 
and you want to point out that both of these species, the starfish in the one and the uh, sea otter in the other, are keystone species. So you're going to put that term up on the board, ask students to define it, and then help them with the definition. So the idea behind a keystone species is that when you remove it, it has a disproportionate influence on the ecosystem. Um, and so normally if you remove one, then the other, then the direct, there's a direct relationship between it and like, let's say it's food source, and you might see a change there. But if you remove one species and several different species in the ecosystem seem to collapse, or the whole ecosystem itself begins to collapse, then you, you know it's a keystone species. And these indirect effects that we have on other organisms are called trophic cascades. So it's like rippling down the trophic pyramid to where even though it's not a direct food source of this organism, somehow it totally messes up the whole system. So we see this in Yellowstone, right? When the wolves are removed, the elk then begin to grow out of control, but the elk graze on willows and things along the along the riverbanks. And so the willows begin to, to die, the seedlings can't come up, and then you have uh, beavers who can't build their dams because the willow trees are not there and like you have all these cascading effects that the wolves don't directly eat beavers or they don't directly eat willows but it has an effect on them when they're gone um, and so that's what you want to talk about right okay so then now it's time for them to analyze their terraria so before you jump right into the terraria i would encourage you to have a discussion based on your drawings on the board about the trophic pyramids from the Serengeti and see if they can start to fit the organisms they put into their terraria onto a trophic pyramid similar to the Serengeti and make some hypotheses about regulations that are going on. Now in this case they've got decomposers in there which are technically consumers um, so you can talk about it that way um, but you're going to try to figure out the health of their ecosystems depending on what they put in there. Okay, so a few ways that we've come up with, and we'll see if this works, of how to um, measure the health of their little terraria. Um, I bought a bunch of testers, and like I said, they haven't come yet, so as soon as they get here, I will redo this little video. Ooh, I don't know why that reset. Um, so they're analyzing their terraria here. Okay, and so we have th uh, four different, or excuse me, three different test strips that need to go into the terraria before they totally uncap it. Because we're gonna try to capture the atmosphere that's in there. Now I realize as soon as they lift that lid, it's going to do some gas exchange, but we're gonna try to be as fast as we can and see if this works. So we have humidity test strips and the little bottle has the, has the scale of what the color should be. So that'll measure how much humidity is in the air in there. We have oxygen testers. So these are those little stay fresh packs that you would put into like dried, canned food or whatever that are oxygen absorbers uh, but it'll actually has a little indicator spot on it that will change colors depending on how much how much oxygen was in the environment and then the ph strip that obviously is measuring ph so if they can hold all three together and just sort of toss them into their terraria and recap it as fast as they can that's the hope that this <laughs> might work we'll see um, but each of these indicators should show up within, within a, a minute or two, and especially these oxygen indicators. You need to be very careful when you take them out of the package. They're going to be exposed to room air, so you need to get them into the jars as fast as possible so that they are reacting to the jar air rather than the room air. And we'll see. It may not work as well as we think. But once they've done that, give them three minutes, right? So the idea here being if it's high oxygen, it would indicate a healthy level of photosynthesis going on. Whereas if it's low oxygen, then maybe the photosynthesis is not thriving in there or there's a lot of decomposition. So decomposition, these little decomposers are consumers. So they're gonna be using the oxygen in the jar and emitting CO2. And so your pH strip, hopefully it lands somewhere where moisture gets on it. If not, they can actually open the lid and put their, their pH strip right into some of the water that's in the jar. Um, you want to get water on that pH strip because the water will have absorbed the CO2 that's in the air and it may become a little acidic based on how much CO2 is available. And then the humidity would just indicate healthy levels of moisture in the jar. Um, here's some additional thoughts that we, we had about it that, that you know, charcoal is, is antifungal and so maybe even antimicrobial and so it's going to slow decomposition. So your isopods are tritivores, so they're eating the decomposing matter, and so we want them to have food, but if you added charcoal, maybe they have less food, and so they wouldn't do as well. The ladybug and the raisin, they're gonna be eating the fruits. They're not really gonna prey on anything else, but if there's a high level of decomposition, 
they may not do very well in there. The charcoal would keep that down. So if there's charcoal, the ladybug might survive more. These are just things you can discuss with your, with your class. You ought to put a lot of the observations up on the board so that they can see the class as a whole, what was going on, because not everybody got to test everything. There's really no right or wrong answer to these. Um, we're looking for health. Um, and they're also going to take a, a soil sample and a water sample and look at them under slides, under, under the microscope on slides, and just see if they can see a high level. Now, any bacteria you're trying to see is way, 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 way small, but we're going to actually add methylene blue, so it's a little stain that you're going to add to the slide. That'll help make some of these microorganisms show up better. Um, and they're just trying to get a feel. Can they feel, get a feel for what organisms are available or, or alive in the jar? Um, if you're drawing, they're drawing their trophic pyramid, they're not going to be anywhere above, you know, the primary consumers potentially and producers. But decomposers are sometimes drawn at the bottom underneath producers, even though they're a consumer. Uh, I kind of like them drawn off to the side because they actually return nutrients to the trophic pyramid. Um, but they are a consumer, so you can sort of treat them that way. Excuse me, so then they're going to answer questions 10, 11, and 12. And so in 10, it's asking them to evaluate their experiment. Were there differences in, in terraria health, depending on what organism? You might also ask them where they kept it in their house, whether they gave it sunlight. That might have been a limiting factor for some of them. Um, question 11 asks them what kind of regulation is going on. In most cases, these are going to be bottom-up regulation, like decomposers are bottom-up regulation. Uh, we don't really have any top-down regulation, but they can hypothesize top-down regulation. So maybe if we had added aphids in there, the ladybugs would have been a top-down regulator. Or if we had grasshoppers in there, that, that birds would then regulate. So just have them kind of think outside the jar, so to speak, um, of what that would look like. And then question 12 asks if there's any kind of keystone species. So you might find, and we don't really know how this is going to turn out because we haven't seen all the results, but you might find that having one particular organism in there made all the difference in the world for the health of the ecosystem. Um, and so that could be a keystone. Now in this case, for this particular setup, moss is probably the keystone species here, but we didn't allow anyone not to have moss. But if you had a terraria where the moss died, everything probably died, right? Um, so basically you just want to emphasize this bottom-up, top-down regulation, trophic pyramids, trophic cascades, keystone species. Um, the students cannot take their terraria home. Uh, I know they might want to. You can encourage them to build their own out of their own supplies, but we need all of those supplies, including the living materials for next semester's lab, especially the moss. Moss doesn't grow very well in the middle of winter, and we need these in February for, for our next labs. And so um, Eli is going to make a, a quick video that you should watch on how to collect materials. This is going to be a messy lab. Please, please, please have your students clean up after themselves. If they spill dirt and mud and crap all over the tables, please make them wash them. Okay, make them to clean up after themselves. Let's try to salvage as much of the material as we can. If the moss is in really bad shape and like it's slimy, then we don't want to keep that obviously. But if there's any hope that, that Eli can um, nurse them back to health, let's try to, try to keep it. Um, I think that's it for the lab itself. We'll take a look at the homework now. Okay, the homework for this lab is based on another video that's 39 minutes long. I would strongly encourage you to watch the video so you get some context because um, you could bring in a lot of these ideas in lab itself. Um, so this is looking at the Serengeti. It's looking at the food the food trophic pyramid that we, that we built at the beginning of lab um, and, and specifically looking at wildebeest populations. And, and what we learn is that the wildebeest populations um, when, when a vaccine was introduced to control rinderpest, which was a virus that was killing local livestock, um, it actually stopped killing buffalo and wildebeest, uh, the rinderpest, and so all of a sudden the populations began to just explode. And it talks about why. Um, and so when they look at this, grasses, buffalo, they're going to they're gonna put in whether it's uh, top-down or bottom-up regulation, and density dependent or independent and, and top-down regulators are usually density independent and, and bottom-up regulation is, is dependent on size of the population. Um, and so the migratory versus non-migratory, the non-migratory wildebeest are being subject to predation, so top-down, whereas the migratory wildebeest are, are um, bottom-up at how much food they can, they can find. So those are the ones that are kind of tricky. Um, and then it's going to ask what factors are affecting buffalo populations prior to 1964. This is the rinderpest. So that's that virus, um, and, and it's considered a 
top-down regulator. It's like a predator or a parasite. It's a virus. Um, question three asks them why the population of buffaloes leveled off, but the wildebeest continued to climb, and that's because the wildebeest learned how to migrate. They evolved this migratory behavior. And so the buffalo are stuck in the area where they are, so they are bottom up regulated by how much food is available, but the wildebeest can follow the food. And then the scientists went out and actually looked at the bone marrow inside of the bones of carcasses of wildebeest to determine whether the population, whether the wildebeest that died was in good health or not. And so if it was in good health and it died, it was it died of predation. If it was in poor health, it died of starvation. So if it was predation, it's top down regulation. If it's starvation, it's bottom up regulation. Um, so like I said, the wildebeest begin to migrate and that allows them to follow the food source. Plus their predators don't migrate. Um, and so the top-down regulation is removed and their bottom-up regulation is, is weakened because they're allowed to follow the food. They, they have this ability to follow the food, so they're less regulated from the bottom and from the top, which allowed their populations to really, really boom. Um, and then it asks if a wildebeest-specific predator was actually migrating with the herds, then you would reintroduce that top-down regulation, which would slow population growth. And then this, this kind of rule of thumb is the larger body sizes are controlled by how much food is available, so bottom-up regulation. The smaller body sizes are being controlled by predation because they're easier to catch, so top-down. Um, and explain why increased wildebeest populations lead to giraffes. This is such a fascinating story. So the wildebeest are eating all of the grass, and that um, it reduces the amount of wildfires that, that rip through the Serengeti. And so all of the trees were disappearing because they'd, they'd have these little shoots, little baby trees, but then they get burned up in the wildfires. So when we reduce the wildfires, it allows more trees to grow. And with more trees growing, it allows more giraffes to be on the Serengeti, which is really cool. So that's a classic example of a trophic cascade. So this last question here, why are wildebeest a keystone species? There are all, are all kinds of trophic cascades that result from the, the presence of wildebeest in the population. So you need to describe some of those. Um, and that's it for the homework. Make sure you take the time to watch both of the videos so you are ready. Alrighty.